All right. I'm Brooks Davis. I work for SRI International and uh, work on the, been working on the Cherry Project for a dozen years now, almost 13 years. Um, and yeah, I'm going to talk to you about what Cherry is and memory safety, why it's important, um, why it is a, uh, in a sense, an existential threat to our, our community where we're writing in catastrophically unsafe languages. Um, and so, and, and how we can do something about it. So, I got a question for the audience. What makes today of all days special? It's a historical event, 35 years ago. Anyone? Andy? Nope. Kirk? Nope. 35 years ago today, the Morris worm, uh, the Morris worm spread throughout the entire internet, um, taking down a whole bunch of systems. Um, one, of, one of the several attacks that was used was a buffer overflow. Um, so we've been, we've been dealing with these for a while. So let's, let's talk a little bit, bit about the history of the buffer overflow. So according to Wikipedia, um, buffer overflows as an attack were first documented in uh, 1972 um, in, a, in a document called the uh, Computer Security technology planning study. Um, if you ask my boss, uh, Peter Neumann, um, he will tell you that Multex both identified the problem and solved it well before that. <laughs> uh, but that's usually the case for any security challenge. Um, but uh, so that's, so we've, we've known about them for a while. Um, and as I said, you know, it's one of, in 1988, it was one of several exploits employed by the, the Morris worm. Um, there was a buffer overflow, and, and I will say actually that I didn't put it on here, but ap probably apocryphally, um, there is some reason to believe that the first packet sent on the internet resulted in a buffer overflow and crashed the endpoint. So, been around a while. So, and just just as a, a little point on this, you know, in history, uh, 1993 is what we call as FreeBSD's first release. Um, 1996. We had one of the first like hackerly write-ups of buffer overflows, you know, smashing the stack for fun and profit. Um, so a classic, classic paper uh, of ha on on buffer overflow attacks. So like we've had 50 years, right? So surely we've solved this problem. Um, you know, unfortunately, not so much. A um, couple examples from industry. Well, industry progress, none. We're spending hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, we've built great tools. We've fixed tons of bugs. And yet, here is you know, a 12-year, 13-year span of, of vulnerabilities at, micro, at Microsoft. Memory safety vulnerabilities, 70% across the board. Um, and you, say, might, you might look at this uh, 2018 on the slide and say, oh, that's a while ago. Well, here's a recent graph from Google. Um, it's 69% or are either uh, memory safety or use after free bugs. Um, like we're, we're just making no progress whatsoever. Um, and that's really depressing. Um, so governments are taking note of this. So here's a, here's a bit of advice that came out. Um, the US Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, um, along with 10 other agencies across seven countries, that's uh, Five Eyes plus, uh, um, plus the Netherlands and Germany endorsed this guidance. It includes the use of memory safe programming languages. And as I point out in this guidance, they say basically things like address space layout randomization, control flow integrity, fuzzing, they're all great, they're all helpful. And at the end, they are failures. They do not solve the problem. So they say move to, move to modern, modern memory safe programming languages. Now, as a project that, uh, you know, as, as, as a project that's written in C, this is a challenge for us. Um, and, you know, we probably need to worry about that. So why should we worry about that? Well, that's guidance, but when does guidance become regulation? Um, one, one way it starts to become regulation is it becomes a procurement requirement. Um, and usually, you know, as you know, as happened with IPv6, it starts out as a requirement that you have to have a plan um, to migrate. Um, and then, 
it becomes best practice, things become best practice over time, and then sometimes best practice becomes a requirement, even if it never becomes law that it's a requirement. Um, and I'll give you a quick example of that. FTC versus D-Link. Um, Federal Trade Commission saw that D-Link was doing an absolutely atrocious job. They weren't like the only players doing this, but um, by any means, but they were the ones who ended up on the, the sharp end of the stick. Um, the, you know, they were failing to secure their wireless cameras. Um, they were using default passwords and exposing them to the internet. Um, and in other cases, there were, there were things like, so in this, this settlement that happened, you know, the, I think the actual case started in 2016, and then in 2019 there was this final settlement um, where they agreed to fix a lot of things, they recalled a bunch of products, um, it was expensive, and as a result, there's an effective ban on, for instance, default passwords in consumer, consumer electronics, and in fact, um, I don't remember if it was this case or another one, but you can't have MAC address derived passwords either um, because those are trivially observable. Uh, so, you know, that, that put costs on manufacturing and whatnot, um, but it also helped consumers. So this is something, you know, we need to, to look to the future. So now that I've been scary about this, um, I'll give you a bit of hope. The next line in the CISA guidance is Secure Hardware Foundation. I wouldn't read too much into the words on this slide particularly, um, I, my understanding is this bullet point was added somewhat last minute and isn't the pitch I would make, but the pitch here is that there are hardware foundations that can get us to memory safety, and I'm going to talk more about Cherry and how it can do that. So Cherry, the short, short, short version is Cherry is an architectural extension that makes C and C++ memory safe. That means spatial safety at the C object level um, with some more effort, uh, spatial safety at a sub-object level, as in when you access an array uh, within an struct, for instance, and then um, with some operating system work, um, it uh, also provides heap temporal safety. So Cherry is a processor architecture protection model. Um, we, we compose a capability system model um, capabilities are a long, a concept with long history and um, some successful adoption in FreeBSD. A form of capability um, that, that we've adopted is uh, file descriptors as capabilities for system resources in Capsica. Um, and once you enter capability mode, you can only use capabilities to ask, access system resources. You can't, um, you can't go and access resources uh, so you, you, you can't access resources by, by name anymore. Um, Cherry capabilities are memory capabilities. They provide you access to memory, and I'll talk a little more about the details. But Cherry adds a new set of instruction set architecture uh, primitives, um, and it's implemented in the microarchitecture um, of CPUs and system on chips. Um, and it enables new, new behavior. So Cherry mitigates vulnerabilities in C and C++ uh, code bases, in particular trusted computing bases, like your operating system. Um, so, you know, hypervisors, operating systems, language runtimes, browsers. Um, you know, it's worth noting, for example, with the uh, language runtimes, you know, Java is generally memory safe, but your typical JVM sits on top of a million lines, literally, of C code. Um, and then there's the JNI, which gives you access to every piece of C ever written. Um, so we provide fine-grained memory protection. Um, that's the first line of defense and sort of the main point of my talk today, as well as scalable compartmentalization. Um, and in particular, cherry compartmentalization, when combined with um, fine memory protection, gives you orders of magnitude faster, faster domain switches um, and allows for much finer-grained compartments. So now let's go down to the bottom. The, the core piece of cherry is that we add a new hardware type, um, the Cherry capability. Um, on a 64-bit system, this is 128-bit, um, a new 128-bit data type. It extends the existing 64-bit address um, and then adds permissions and, and bounds, uh, which control what, what, what addresses can be referenced 
and what operations can be performed. So a permission that doesn't have execute, for instance, obviously can't be executed. Um, a, a capability, um, so if you have a, a read-write capability, um, you, you, can, you can read, you can write, but you can't execute. Um, and so that, that metadata controls how these capabilities can be used. Capabilities are protected um, through a combination of tags and guarded manipulation. So the tag, um, which is the basically a 129th bit, um, is separate and not directly manipulatable. So it, it is either when it's in memory, it's off to the side, um, perhaps in an ECC bit, uh, a stolen ECC bit, or perhaps simply striped with the data. It depends on your, on your memory architecture uh, that you implement in the system on chip. Uh, so if a non-capability operation accesses rights to that memory, the tag is cleared. So a simple, if you store a word, you know, if you were, for instance, you write a buffer overflow um, and you write out uh, a bunch of characters and then you write over the capability, well, it's no longer a valid capability. If you then load it and try to access memory, that fails. Likewise, if you perform an invalid ma manipulation in registers, the tag that's in the registers is also cleared and therefore that capability is no longer valid. Um, key point here is that all memory access in a Cherry system is via a capability. That could be an, that could be an explicit capability, so you, you get a capability that you were, you were given at runtime, um, and you, you've manipulated it, you've maybe chopped it up a bit for different al allocations, and now you do a read, That's, and you do it explicitly via capability, um, then you use that, but it can also be implicitly. And one of the key features of Cherry is that on a Cherry processor, existing code can continue to run. There's a default data capability and a program counter capability. And once those are set up, integer accesses can be performed. Now, in a mode where you have a default capability that's broad, say to the whole process address space, you don't really get a lot of benefit from Cherry, but you can still run your existing code unmodified on that processor. So that's the the key value there. Now, to, to reiterate, um, the two key applications of Cherry, again, are, are fine-grained memory protection for C and C++. Um, and so that's strong source-level compatibility. We, have, we, we, we are very, very compatible with existing C and C++ code, and I'll get into that a bit more later. Um, we do require recompilation to gain the benefits of Cherry, um, but those benefits are quite strong. So in particular, we don't depend on, we don't depend on uh, cryptographic keys, which could be leaked or guessed, um, as with something like, like pointer authentication um, or ASLR. So every, every protection with Cherry is deterministic. Um, and what we found in retrospective studies, if you take the Cherry protections, about two thirds of, of uh, memory safety vulnerabilities are eliminated. And in practice, that's about half of all vulnerabilities um, in, a, in, a, in a typical code base um, that's, that's C or C++. Um, we have modest overheads. In common cases, it's somewhere between zero and 5%. In fact, we even see occasional benchmarks where we see negative, uh, where, where we actually have negative overhead, but those are really probably benchmarking artifacts. Some pointer dense uh, workloads can be higher. Um, and I will say that if you, if you take me up on the offer to try it out later, I'll say benchmarking is complicated. Um, <laughs> so, um, make, but, but we have done quite a lot of work with ARM. We have spent countless hours on their, their high-end FPGA clusters to really nail down where the effects are, and the results are extremely promising. Um, and then scalable software compartmentalization. Um, the, this builds on memory safety and it builds on the observation that what you, what you can reach and access within a given address space is a function, is basically the, a transitive closure of your register set. So your register, ha, your register set has a bunch of capabilities in it. They can access more things in memory. You can load capabilities from there. But you can create disjoint sets of memory. Um, and so you can have multiple, you can have multiple compartments within an address space so you don't have to pay context switching costs, you don't have to have TLB pressure, um, you simply have to make an exchange of your, of your register set through some mechanism, and we have several mechanisms, but I'm not gonna dive into that today. 
Uh, but those, those, those context switches can be extremely fast, um, typically on the easily below 300 cycles, um, much lower than even a basic system call. So we get enormous performance wins, and we, th we think this is going to allow us to both to do, it, do a couple of things. First, make existing compartmentalization faster, um, but also to enable much finer grain compartmentalization. Um, in fact, we're, we're hoping to be part of a program. We've been gotten a selection letter, but not, we're not in negotiation yet, um, that aims to add vastly more compartmentalization to a number of applications, so both kernels and programs, um, using automated techniques to explore compartmentalization boundaries, um, looking to add you know, thousands of compartments. Whereas right now, if you look at something like the Chrome web browser, you, know, you have a compartment, you have a process per tab. Um, and you know, at some point, if you open too many tabs, you don't get more processes. Um, and, and so things have to start being conflated. We want to have it to the point where we have a process per, per rendered object within the page, for instance. And we think that's possible. So for those of us who are, of course, building things with C and C++, what is Cherry C++ and how difficult is it to, to use? So Cherry C and C++ is really C++ with minor adaptations. A, cher a normal Cherry C++ program that isn't doing explicit capability manipulations, like setting bounds, uh, and just relying on language primitives, is a C, and C, C or C++ program. It's, it's completely compatible. Um, however, you need to be clear about some things in the program. So we, we basically, to, to have a program work with Cherry, um, you need to do a somewhat more expressive job than you might have done otherwise. You can't, you can't just cheat and cast everything through a long. You, know, you can't cast your pointers to longs, do whatever you want, and then come out the other end sometime later. Because a long is a 64-bit type, typically, and a Cherry capability is 128-bit, and again, requires that guarded manipulation. Um, so your types have to preserve provenance, and when you, for instance, if you are adding two int pointer t's together, one of them needs to be picked. So the compiler will by default pick the leftmost one, um, and, uh, and, it, and it will warn you. So you would, you typically need to add a cast to make it clear um, which one it is, but it's really as simple as adding a cast or tweaking a type. Also, copying, because pointers go everywhere in C, um, copying of memory, like with memcopy, um, needs to be capability aware. Um, this is fairly straightforward. Basically, you do the standard optimization that memcopies always do, which is they copy by words, um, except now you use capability instructions to copy anything that's capability aligned. Um, the one surprising until you think about it for a moment and then it's obvious thing is that sort like QSort is a copying function because it moves things around in memory. Um, so your sort has to be updated the same way. Again, these are the standard optimizations we make. So we just have to update them a bit and typically everything's fine. The most naive possible implementation won't work, but it's not an issue. Um, and then there are some cases where you need to do things like set bounds on memory allocations. And for those, you, do use, you need to use compiler intrinsics um, to access those instructions. And those are the cases where your code does become not traditional C, but those changes are typically small. Um, and in many cases, um, for instance, in our adaptation of the FreeBSD kernel, those changes, um, those changes can be hidden behind macros, so it's not even you're if defing the code and you have one path for cherry and one path for not. It's we have this thing that we do, and it's a no-op if you're not using Cherry. It's not, that's not the case for everything, but in many cases, that is. Um, and then the result is we have a memory-safe C. So it's spatially safe, at, again, at C object level. And then we can have sub-object safety um, with some additional work um, because there are some patterns that aren't compatible with sub-object safety. <clears throat> for instance, uh, container of, uh, patterns or sort of pseudo object orientation, which we use a fair bit in the kernel, um, can be a problem. But again, these are, these are not huge. It's more work than, than a regular port. 
But the result is still C. There are simply a few annotations you don't, you don't, uh, that compile to nothing um, in a non-cherry program. Um, otherwise, it works, you know, works about the same. How, and then, but we do, we become a little less compatible with C. So you, in the sense that certain idioms have to change. Um, and then with heap, heap temporal safety, um, we implement that with a combination of the OS and the runtime. The observation that makes heap temporal safety work um, in Jerry is that because a capability has a base, a base address, um, and, in, and while you can change that address, that, that base address, you can only move it up, and therefore you can always tell what allocation range a capability came from. And of course, because of the tags, you can always identify what is a capability, unlike in a traditional garbage collection system, um, where, where you, know, you could XR a pointer with something to hide it. Um, so we can actually perform reasonably efficiently, oops, a scan of memory. That's unfortunate. Oh no, here we are, good. Um, we can perform a scan of memory um, and, and, and sweep all of memory and revoke all pointers which, which have been deallocated. So I'd like to imagine a spectrum of software compatibility um, and talk about why, where, where Cherry sort of fits in things. You can imagine this, you know, the status quo today, um, security's not great. You know, as I said, you know, we've not been making a lot of progress there, um, at least in, in, in C programs. Um, and we expend a fair bit of effort because we are finding and fixing these bugs. We are, we are, we are suffering all the time. Um, you know, we might, the sort of the, you know, the, the, the simplified version of the CISA view is that we should rewrite it all in Rust. Um, that's a lot of work. You know, may, maybe large language models help us there um, or other techniques um, are gonna allow us to rewrite our code, but there's a lot of code. Um, it would be conservative to guess that there's 100 billion lines of C and C++ code in the world. Um, open Hub, Black Duck Open Hub shows somewhere north of 20 million lines of open source code. Um, it's, you can be fairly confident that uh, um, there's quite a bit more out there. You know, the, the supposed, I, I look to try to find an answer to how much Windows source code is. There's no one wants to say, but one of the leaks did have um, more files than there are lines of code in FreeBSD. A lot of that's probably translation and things, but still. Um, so we like to think that Cherry provides us a nice sweet spot on the spectrum where we can put in relatively low effort, adapting our code bases. We do have to pick new hardware, but you know, that's a thing we do on a continuing basis. Um, and we can get with with relatively little effort, we can get more, tremendously more security. So that is, that is our hope with Cherry, um, and I think things are proving out there. Um, so you might ask, well, how, how much work is it to adapt code? Um, one measure of that is how much change do you have to make in your code? Um, so here's an example. It's a slightly old table, but basically still accurate, of the cost, the overheads of, of changing the FreeBSD kernel and all of user space. So what you'll notice here is in every column, we're less than 1% uh, lines of code change. Um, in the kernel, we're looking at a bit less than 0.2% overhead uh, or lines of code change. And in fact, that number I would say is high because one aspect of Cherry um, that we've exploited in our porting process is that we actually have two C, C modes. We have sort of the one I've I, I've talked about where we make C memory safe and we make all pointers capabilities. We have another mode where only select pointers are annotated with capabilities. This has the advantage that you don't, for instance, have to fix quite so many things in some ways, but if you do what we did in the FreeBSD kernel when it was a hybrid program, um, we annotated every user space access and made every, every pointer to user space a capability. Um, and that allowed us to have pure capability user space um, while still having a hybrid, hybrid uh, kernel. Um, it aided porting, it has possibly some performance advantages, although we're still evaluating there. But it requires a lot of code changes because now every time you have a system call that takes a, takes a pointer, 
you have to annotate every function that uses that pointer and every function that uses a pointer that might potentially be a capability. So there's a lot of churn there. So I would say this number is high. Um, I don't have a good number as to what the real number is, but it's probably 0.1% or something um, if you did a completely pure capability kernel. Um, you notice drivers, quite small, 0.04%. Um, the runtime, uh, that's higher. We're almost, almost a half a percent. Um, but that's, you know, that's, all the, that's where the memory allocators are. That's where the sorting functions are. Um, it's where you know, the signal handlers, all the horrible systems-y stuff. Um, is, is, in, is in libc. And so that's a higher amount of churn, but it's still not, not huge. Again, you know, it's, you know, we're changing five lines in a thousand uh, from there. And then like libc++, actually smaller, which is nice. Um, in part, I think, because abstractions are better there, and also libc++ gets to build on top of libc. And so much of the ugliness stays in libc. And then programs, 0.02%. Um, um, so, you know, almost, almost nothing. And this, this number um, holds in a number of studies. So we ported six million lines of KDE um, to, to, uh, to Cherry, and that, again, 0.02%. And much of that change was, in fact, fixing cross-compilation um, because it just wasn't working, rather than actually changing the source code. So, yeah, to, to reiterate the adaptability thing, you know, we require some small changes for spatial safety. We have to deal with the pointer size and alignment changing. We have to deal with preserving provenance. Um, we have to clarify our pointer manipulation. Um, and what I mean by that is, for instance, sometimes we do, we do ugly things, like we realign a pointer to a buffer, or we stash bits in the low bits of something that we know is well aligned. It's a common, common trick. Um, we also need to make sure we use correct types and types that mean something because um, we can't just say, eh, everything fits in a long because a long is a register and whatever. Um, we need a more mature model of the world. And then we need to tweak allocators a bit because we want to put bounds on allocations. Um, so most, but it's worth noting that most programs don't need any of these changes. So most programs in FreeBSD required no changes at all. Even, you know, sort of like a middle of the road complicated thing like OpenSSH, I think the original version required three changes, and I think maybe we have no changes in the tree right now. Um, I think we submitted one fix upstream that was accepted, and then the other ones were actually overcome by events because OpenBSD needed to fix the same things for different reasons. For instance, they used to pass pointers between the parent and child, but then they added a feature to re-exec the child to, to randomize, and then they couldn't pass the pointers anymore, and they had to pass indexes, which is what our code did. So, uh, so that's pretty nice. And then there's a sort of less compatible but more secure option, so the adding bounds to internal program allocators, you probably want to do that. Um, you probably want to add revocation to your internal, internal allocators, although maybe not. It depends on your programming model. Um, and then subject bounds are a little complicated, and in the in the strongest version of subobject bounds, we definitely actually disagree with what C says, so we make, we make array access a little different, and we put bounds on references to array objects, which is definitely not permitted by C. So, um, and then temporal safety requires a bit more work, but again, we've abstracted most of that away, so there's libraries to help you out, um, and you only need to change the allocators. So pretty, adoption's pretty straightforward. So let's talk about hardware. So there's a number of, a number of different implementations of Cherry. Um, we started out on MIPS um, because that was the 64-bit platform that was available and mostly patent-free um, at the time we were, we were starting over a decade ago. Um, we gave a talk about that implementation at ARM, gave a practice talk there, um, and some important people, chief architect, uh, Richard Grisselthwaite was in, in the audience, for instance, and said, this seems like a neat idea, let's talk. So in 2014, we started talking. In the fullness of time, this became the Morello, uh, the, the uh, Morello prototype. So the Morello project is funded by uh, the UK government. They funded uh, about 
seven million dollars into this, or 70 million pounds into this, and then industry put in a bit more than that um, to, to build this prototype architecture. They extended the ARM V8A instruction set with Cherry. Um, they built a prototype system on chip based on the Neoverse N1. Uh, the Neoverse N1 is, for instance, what is in Graviton instances on AWS, um, and it's the basis, it or, diff or varying generations of it, is the basis for most of the super high-end ARM servers. Um, and then they built a prototype based on the prototype board, um, and then we, we provided tool chains, and that, well, they provided tool chains, we provided an operating system. Um, they have implemented GCC and have, a, have an early implementation of Linux uh, as well. And so this is like a real thing. It's a 2.5 gigahertz processor, four core processor, um, and there's one here. I'm presenting on it. So, it, so that so that that is that is so the prototype. Um, so how well does it work? Well, as I said, I'm presenting on it. Um, I was going to do a demo right at this point, but for software reasons that are not Cherry's fault, I'm going to do it at the end. Um, <laughs> uh, but right here, I'll show you this screenshot. Here shows you a a, a desktop where every everything on here, all these pieces are memory safe. So it's KDE desktop. Um, we have an editor. We have a debugger, um, and and you know I'm using a memory safe uh, presentation. Well, PDF viewer. So there are a bunch of options for trying Morello today. Um, we we provide via our website. We have a we have a tool called Cherry Build. It is a giant mess of Python. Um, <laughs> Thousands upon thousands of lines to build everything. It is our, our Swiss Army knife of build tools. Um, the important point, though, is that you can download it. Um, if you download it on your, you know, on a modern Mac, um, you can run, you can do a, install a few packages with Brew and then with Homebrew or, or your favorite package manager, and then run one command and boot into a Cherry BSD box in a couple hours, um, and it will build your whole tool chain. Your, the operating system, all, all the bits. Um, we also have available, if you talk to, talk to me or email Robert Watson, um, we have remote access at University of Cambridge. We've got a bunch of Merlot boxes in a data center there. Um, and one of them is actually part of the GCC compile farm. And any open source project can sign up and get on that box. They're like not super performant, so if everyone jumps on that box, everyone will be sad. Um, but. Uh, but uh, that, that is a system you can get access to quite quickly. Um, you pretty much just need to send an email. Um, right now. And we're, we can provide jail access, uh, access to, to uh, FreeBSD jails. Um, soon we're going to be able to provide Beehive VMs, but we need to merge the code. Um, so we need, to, we need to finish the reviews and get that in. Um, we are hoping to have a release in the next week or so that we'll have that. And then in limited quantity, full system access is available. If you have a UK arm, if your company has a UK arm, um, I would suggest you uh, go to the Technology Access Program website, um, and there's a request a board button. Um, they have a few different options uh, available under this program. It sort of ranges from you get a board and no help um, to uh, so some options where there's some some funding available to to do a particular specified project. Not a huge amount of money, but um, you know, enough, to, enough to subsidize a little R&D effort. In addition to that, we, ported, uh, we also ported uh, Cherry to RISC-V um, as part of the DARPA Sith program. And something that derived from that work is, is a project that Microsoft announced uh, earlier this year called Chariot. Chariot is a you know IoT focused as you might guess, um, or very small system microcontroller. It's based on the very smallest profile of Risk Five, so it's 16 registers instead of 32. Like it is as stripped down as possible, and it has Cherry applied to it. So they've open sourced a a, a core and a little micro a little uh, microkernel OS. Um, that lets you you safely run run C and C plus plus. They've also like ported um, ported a, a JavaScript a JavaScript runtime to it, so you can have 
you know, JavaScript in your light bulbs that's secured by Cherry. Um, it's all very neat. Um, and in fact, um, there will be boards available soon. They're gonna, they won't be, they won't be ASICs this first round, but the, the low risk project has been funded to build some demo boards, uh, some sort of prototype boards um, that they're gonna give out a hundred of them to various companies and organizations, and they're gonna be available for purchase as well. So you'll be actually be able to buy things and build, not with FreeBSD, because um, this is a microcontroller, but you'll be able to build Cherry microcontroller based stuff and actually build real things. A kind of a neat thing on this board, you notice there's a lot of headers. Um, so this top one is a Raspberry Pi compatible header, so you can put Raspberry Pi uh, hats. There's this and this, I think, are Arduino headers. I don't remember what this one is, but there's, uh, there's a, be a bunch of connections. So you'll be able to build little things with Cherry um, and actually like control the world. Um, and they're also gonna build a fancier one based on Open Titan. Um, I don't, I couldn't find a, a date for it, but the Sonata is in progress. They've actually done initial board runs, like not real board runs, but like to get the connectors in the right place and make sure that, are, that things fit. Um, so they're, they're making rapid progress. Uh, so that's like a thing you'll be able to buy and try out Cherry, so that'll be pretty cool. And then some breaking news, two days ago, uh, Codasip announced a, that they're, they're, an, they're a RISC-V IP company, so if you want to build a system on chip with RISC-V, um, they, they sell a number of cores, and they are now selling a Cherry one. They haven't disclosed the full details, but he did ask, and <clears throat> what I've been told is that it's a 64-bit a uh, application class core with an MMU, so um, I believe it was initially intended to run Linux, so it'll definitely run FreeBSD. Um, with, with modest effort. So like there's real hardware in the pipeline. Um, so that's, that's pretty cool. Um, so I, Cherry, Cherry is becoming a real thing, um, something you can, you know, heading towards something you can actually buy. Um, I guess I will mention, since I've sort of been meandering through the various ports we've done, we've also um, developed an initial sketch of Cherry for x86, um, and we're, in very early discussions with, with the x86 vendors um, about, you know, could this work? Uh, and but the goal here is that, that we be compatible across these ecosystems um, and, and be able to build on all the processor architectures, and we believe that's going to be the case. I think we've really demonstrated it with the MIPS, RISC-V, and ARM ports. Um, our code really doesn't differ except in the sort of grotty bits at the bottom. Um, application code doesn't vary at all. Um, so, yeah, I think we're, we're making good progress there. So, I'd be happy to take questions, and I can also show a little, little demo. I'll leave this up here for a moment, but, uh, and then I'll show some demos. So, like... And I'm probably out of time. Uh, <laughs> no, we've got a couple minutes, especially okay. since you started late, we'll, we'll bump the schedule by about the five minutes. All right. Um, I had a question from someone on YouTube, uh, which they asked, uh, do you plan to support pure capability for the kernel and user space in FreeBSD slash Cherry? I so, would like to I, that. I, yeah, I guess I, w I would say that um, as soon as there is rational hardware to run on, like non-prototype non hardware um, in the pipeline that we will be able to buy, that, then we will start looking at merging. It's gonna be a project. Um, I mean, unquestionably, it's a bunch of work, the diffs, well, 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 I say the diffs are small, they are also broad. So review is complicated. You know, we have review bottlenecks even internally getting features in. So it's, it's gonna be an effort, but yeah, we basically as soon as there's gonna be a platform to run it on, we'll be looking for ways to get it in. Well, well, John's running the mic over. I'll just start the demo here. So I've got a little uname on the machine that I'm running on. So it's ARCH64C. That's our name for uh, ARM uh, with capabilities. That's our, our default ABI. And we're running the, uh, the uh, pure cap kernel here. So memory safe, uh, uh, spatially memory safe kernel. So I'll take a question here now. Right, so um, is this coming to the, uh, the uh, Intel AMD64 world anytime soon? Well, so we have a prototype. John's been the, the lead on that. Um, it is 
the cur current state is that we have a user space instruction set model sort of basically worked out. We've got, we've got the core things, we have a proof of concept. Um, I can't talk about partnerships at this point, but we're definitely attempting to talk to everyone and trying to, trying to bring it there. Okay, and the, the Cherry organization, so are, are you uh, more FreeBSD specific than anything, or are you trying to bring this to the entire world? Uh, we're trying to bring it to the entire world. Um, our research group is, uh, our, our, our research group is fairly FreeBSD focused, um, both at uh, SRI and Cambridge. Um, but the goal, is, the goal is to take over the world um, and, and provide Cherry, Cherry to everywhere. Um, right now, though, if you want to like build a product on top of a Unix, it's going to be FreeBSD. Um, the Arm, Arms Linux port is, is continuing to make progress, um, but they don't have you know they don't have the whole stack yet. This is brilliant. Thank you. For some context on x86, um, Brooks mentioned that uh, we first engaged with Arm in 2014, and we got. An initial prototype SSC, it's not officially a part of the architecture, it's just a prototype in 2023 or 2022. So that's like an eight year, eight to nine year lead time. Um, and I would say that on the x86 front, we're not yet at the 2014 stage. So now, so we'll have to see, but I, I don't think it's like years would be a realistic time frame. <coughs> Well, you run that mic over. I've, I've run a little procstat-a here. Um, so we've got a number of things. I think the thing I'd point out here is we have the, uh, the emulator for a number of processes, ELF64C, um, which is to say that's the pure capability kernel. Um, you notice we've got maybe one, one thing here that we haven't ported for whatever reason. We run that in hybrid mode as essentially an unmodified ARM binary. So yes, question. You mentioned a little bit about performance impact um, and these prototype chips, you said there's a four core chip. Yeah. How does performance <clears throat> scale when you get to over 100 CPUs or 64 CPUs, something that the higher number, like a realistic large CPU count chip? Um, so, I mean, I'm not a micro architect, I will say, but um, we don't have, the, I don't think there's any reason to believe that Cherry won't, won't continue to scale. It is not, for instance, table-based, um, it is all, you know, a thing attached to memory. So we push DRAM traffic and cache traffic up slightly, both because our pointers are bigger and because, you know, we're, we have to add the tag. Um, but it's not, like, we're, we're not adding new things that don't scale, you know, or, or that, you know, you have to do lots of work to make them scale. Um, we, don't, we don't make cache coherency more complicated, for instance. And to add to um, Brooks's point about those that are trying to get access, if you've got a UK arm, etc., if you don't have a UK arm, please come and see me if you're interested. So yeah, I've run, run a uh, we've got a, a custom cherry a, a cherry procstat command. Um, so I'm showing here. Um, we have here that says, what's the Cherry support in the process ABI? So P means peer cap. All these things with question marks are kernel. Um, we have a quarantine, is, which is, are we quarantining memory um, address space that has been released by the program, but where we haven't yet revoked it? That means, which is an indicator that the runtime is also um, engaged in revocation um, and, and temporal safety. There's a revoker state thing. It's always going to be none unless you really win a race and something happens to be uh, running a round of revocation at the same time. And then there's the epoch, which is a number that moves monotonically forward um, as we go through passes scanning memory. So a bunch of zeros, but also a bunch of things. So like my PDF viewer here has run, you know, a whole bunch of times, done a lot of garbage collection over, over the time, scanning all of its memory. Um, so. Just a, a quick thing. So, other questions? Um, yes. Just any <coughs> chance on this demo box, you have a small C program that does buffer overflow to run it in hybrid mode and then to run it in capability mode. Um, I am not, so I don't know how to drive the part where I run it in hybrid mode, but I do have one set up. Oops. I will say, uh, so I will say, 
This is the one thing that is not yet pure capability, is the Chrome web browser. We are very, very close. Um, uh, and I would say, actually, as a sort of testament to the, the difficulty of porting, um, we've had one person working on it for less than full time for about a year, and we're just about there. Um, the biggest bottleneck lately has been a combination of he was off on another project and needing to port V8, and we, the, the V8 uh, JavaScript runtime. So we're, we're very close to having a pure capability Chromium. So yeah, I will, I will pull up quickly. Um, we've got Kate uh, browser here, or the, the Kate editor. Um, and so in, the, in this example here, we have a simple program. We have a couple of buffers. We, we make sure that they're you know, laid out the way you would expect on the stack so we could overflow them. Um, and then you know, we write some stuff. And then we use this function to, to hide from the compiler the fact that we're uh, going to do a buffer overflow. And we write one too far into the buffer. So let's go ahead and do a build. Let's see, build selected target, we'll do a clean. Target, build. There we have built, and then let's run. And now, it's hard to see, I'm afraid, um, but here we are. Programmers received a sigprot, it's a new signal we added, a cherry protection violation, um, capability bound fault. Um, and we see we're writing to this address, is the capability, and we'll notice we've written to the to 16 pass off there, so one past the end, and we've got a fault. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't know how to run the, the demo with hybrid mode. Yes, so here, yeah, here um, we show the, the bounds and permissions. So this is a read-write capability store, capability load, um, so sort of the default permissions for, for an allocation either on the stack or on the heap. Um, and then, yeah, the bounds here, and so that's uh, that's the the dumbest example you can come up with. But uh, example, yeah. Oh, uh. <laughs> so, as you were porting applications, uh, have you ever encountered the sick prod, which was? Not a vulnerability. It was just happening sometimes, didn't affect in the runtime. So I mean, did you discover any bugs during your por port into capability mode um, in, so K in KDE and so on? Um, so I mean, we, we have definitely found bugs, although fewer than you might expect. Um, we found a lot of sort of weird off by ones that are mostly harmless. Um, so I would say, uh, well, I think my, fa my favorite example is one that we found fairly early on is that if you hit tab for completion on an empty line in, in Tish, there used to be a bug um, where it would read one before the buffer. Um, and, you know, with little Indian architectures and whatnot, that's almost always a null character. Um, so probably you never noticed, right? Um, and there's, there's a bunch of those, and I exchanged a few messages on uh, on, on Fetty with uh, very, some people at Apple who said, yeah, that's their experience with dash F bound safe as well, is that there's a bunch of things that address sanitizer can't find because they're too small um, and we do find them. I, I found one this, um, for ARM64 when the 16K page support went in, there was a buffer overflow in like writing to the VM page array or something like that that Andrew committed that worked fine on plain ARM64 but Crash right away on Morello in yeah. GMU. They were able to find the number flow that way. Yeah, we also f have found a number of cases in the kernel um, where, like, forgetting to null terminate an initial an, ar an, an, ar an array of things, um, so you would typically hit a null pretty quickly. <laughs> you hope. <laughs> Usually before something blew up, um, that sort of thing. 
So uh, I think we have one more, one last question from Ed, and then we'll take yeah. our break. And I, I, I will say, I'll be around this week. I'll go probably set this up over on the side somewhere so we can we can poke at it and, and talk about it. Yeah, I'm just passing on a question that came uh, on the stream, uh, and the question is about uh, let's let's assume that commercially viable uh, hardware becomes available. How would how would um, it get deployed? Like, what would the uh, timeline look like? Do you think, or how how would it the e ecosystem evolve, and how would Cherry uh, hardware um, replace uh, legacy hardware over time? Ah, uh, boy, ecosystems are complicated. Um, I mean, I, I I would say that right now the the strategy, you know, the what what we're seeing is most likely is it looks like. Um, you know, despite ARM having first mover advantage here, um, RISC-V is going to have product out the door first. Um, I think that's that's where we're going to see it coming because there are there are a few motivated partners there, um, or a few, few motivated players there, and there are some early deployments in discussion that are in. Uh, I guess what I think the the term is first party silicon, which is to say companies that make their own silicon are putting it into the parts of the of the silicon that are they don't expose to the outside world. So they can put pre standard stuff in, and it you know it's a headache um, in the future if if there's a standard version, but um, but it's okay if it's not binary compatible with the next version. You know, it, that, you know it's just something you deal with, right? Um, so I think we'll see those first. Um, Chariot, there's I know there's a, at least one product in development there. Um, I believe a couple, and I know of at least one other project that I can't talk about. Um, but it's they're they're sort of in the small side, roots of trust, that sort of thing. And then you move. I think we'll see things moving up. I will say the the Codasip I believe is sort of at the highest end of the CPU you might use in a root of trust. So, you know, a significant application class processor, but certainly not, you know, the